All right, I think I am live. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Just scroll down. And wait just a couple of minutes. couple of people coming in. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes because I am on here early. I hope everybody is doing well today. Midweek, it's Wednesday, praying for midweek miracles. I try to stay being expecting. Good evening, Sister Haynes. I see you. I see you. I'm actually going live in two different places, one in my Facebook group and then uh, the other at NTG. Good evening. Sister Trish. All right, we have one more minute. Good evening, good evening, Sister Robinson. I hope everybody had a good day. All right, I'm going to go ahead and open up in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you so much, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for life, health, and strength, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, Jesus, that, Lord, we we oftentimes may even take life for granted, Lord God, and then we're reminded, Lord God, uh, when just unfortunate tragedy strikes, Lord God, Jesus, that life is actually so fragile, Lord God. Um, Lord God, we thank you so much, Lord God, for the opportunity, Lord God, Jesus, to be here today, Lord God, to participate, Lord God, Jesus, to uh, be able, Lord God, to be with our loved ones, Lord, and Uh, I just pray, Lord God, Jesus, for everyone that has lost a loved one, Lord God, Jesus, um, recently, Lord God, in in Texas, in that school shooting, Lord God, I just pray for your peace and your comfort, Lord God, to just touch them, Lord God, Jesus, right where they are, Lord God, Jesus. Lord God, I, I pray, Lord God, for those that have ever lost something, Lord God, Jesus. Um, Lord God, I I thank you, Lord God, Jesus, that in your word, it says you will comfort those that are mourning, Lord God, Jesus. So Lord God, let us stand on your word, Lord God, Jesus, because we can find peace in it. We can be confident in it, Lord God. Lord God, we're not meant to stay, Lord God, Jesus, in a state, in in an emotional state longer than we're supposed to. You gave us emotions, Lord God, Jesus, but you also gave us the tools to, to move forward, Lord God, Jesus. So I just Thank you for those here tonight, Lord God, um, that that may be dealing with pain or a situation or something that's going on, Lord God, Jesus. Let us, Lord God, Jesus, have faith. I thank you for increased faith. I speak increased faith over your people, Lord. I just thank you for what you're going to do here tonight. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Good evening. So I'm going to jump right in because it's 701. Thank you so much. Uh, for tuning in tonight. I just want to give honor to God, um, you know, just for this opportunity, you know, for the journey that he has taken me on um, and, you know, helping me to see myself in the way that God sees me. One of my favorite quotes is that God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. You know, all we have to do is say yes, you know, be in a state of willingness. And when God gets our yes, he can use us in mighty ways. And he continues to show me that to this day. Um, And I'm like, okay, what else, God? Like now it's like this expectation of what is next. Um, And in constant, you know, knowing that God is constantly preparing me, preparing us um, for the journey or what he wants to give us. Right. So last week, um, I talked about, oh, hold on. I actually, I want to give honor to my mother, my mother-in-law, 
uh, Pastor T, and I just appreciate her for um, allowing me to come back on uh, this evening. Um, so I just, I, I just love her so much. I appreciate her. I love all of you. I just thank God for all of you um, and just what God is, is going to do uh, tonight. So last week, um, uh, we talked about God's definition of you, you know, and today is the part two to that. And what I want to discuss um, is activating God's definition of you. So just a very quick um, uh, download of last week, um, I was talking about David and um, and also um, Mephibosheth, if I'm saying his name right. But uh, David had this, um, you know, this confidence. He had this amazing confidence in who God was. Um, and it, in spite of how people around him saw him. So I talked a little bit about how as children, we're often learning about ourselves by the reactions of the people around us. So as we grow older, sometimes um, or many times, we don't know who we are. I, I would hear that a lot. Um, and I hear that a lot even to this day. I'm a licensed therapist and also I'm a Christian coach. Um, and, you know, when I say maybe one of the number one complaints that I've heard when I first got it, when I would first see a client or get started with them is, you know, is, is, is they would have this belief that they are not good enough. And that is actually one of the most common beliefs among, I would say, mankind or, you know, um, amongst people is this fear about not being good enough. And it's that fear that usually keeps them from not having a stretched capacity or enlarged capacity to do what God is calling them to do. Um, and the reason why we develop beliefs like that is because, you know, for one, it, in some ways we can be naturally dependent on the people around us. We have this innate sense to want to belong um, and uh, we, you know, we trust, you know, what people are saying about us, our family members are saying about us. And, you know, we also want to please them um, because we don't want to be excluded. We're made to kind of to be together. Um, even like since the beginning, Adam and Eve, you know, are made to love each other and serve God. Right. So this sense of belonging is very strong. Um, so the, the other side, you know, to that is we're also. Um, dealing with or growing up with individuals who are not perfect. The only perfect person was Jesus, right? Um, so we're dealing with individuals who are not perfect. We're growing, you know, we're learning from individuals who are not perfect. Um, and often what we can learn can um, be a tainted view of how God sees us. You know, God's view of us is perfect, thank God. You know, but often what we're learning is, is a, it could be a tainted view. Um, so then we oftentimes recreate the emotional environment of our childhood into our adult lives, right? But, you know, so we talked about David and how this was actually, you know, his story is a little bit different. It's like, even though he, he was young um, and the way people reflected what they thought about him, he didn't see that in himself because he focused his eyes on how God saw him, right? Because the word says, seek, seek my face and my strength continu continually, you know, put me first. Don't have any gods before me. You know, so David is known as what? A man after God's own heart. And he really did that thing. And he, he was so confident as a result. Um, and then a little bit later, we know that right, he had a, a relationship, a great relationship with Jonathan, the son of Saul. Saul struggled. I mean, goodness, he was a king, um, but he was also the people's king. Like he, he, um, you know, the, he was anointed. However, we know that uh, because of his disobedience and, you know, he got off course, God's spirit uh, came off of him, which I'm going to take a uh, talk about a, in, in a little bit. Um, but anyhow, so we have King Saul, we have the son of King Saul, Jonathan. Jonathan had this love for David and they had this amazing relationship and he looked out for him. Um, and then, you know, fast forward uh, later on, you know, after King Saul dies and unfortunately Jonathan died too in battle, um, David, you know, he focused on people's capacity, you know, on, he focused on understanding people's capacity by 
um, again, focusing on how God sees them, not just how God sees him, but how God sees people as well. You know, so even though King Saul treated him terribly, he's like, you know what? I'm still going to maintain respect for you. Um, I'm still going to love you. I'm not going to reflect the behavior that is being shown to me. Um, and it protected his heart by doing that. You know, so even after King Saul died, he didn't have this big parade. You know, he didn't say, yay, you know, he's dead. No, he actually mourned his death and he wanted to give back to somebody that was in the lineage of Saul, of Saul's household. Right. And then towards the end of um, the message last week, um, we, you know, we looked at how uh, he went to Mephibosheth's household and um, Mephibosheth saw himself like as a, a castaway, you know, like sort of upholding or, you know, he's like associated with the sins of his grandfather, you know, like he was kicked out of royalty. He's like, he referred to himself as this dead dog, you know, and David said, you know what, because of the kindness of Jonathan, um, the kindness of your father, I'm going to be kind to you. You know, and so we talked about where Mephibosheth was at in Lodabar, you know, maybe like a place that just didn't reflect who he actually is in Christ. Right. So the question that I left you was, I mean, goodness, you know, if, if John Jonathan's kindness uh, planted a seed um, so powerfully in David that he wanted to um, restore Mephibosheth back to uh, the kingdom or royalty, you know, Jonathan has nothing on Jesus, right? Like Jesus is the ultimate, he paid the ultimate price. Um, he is the ultimate sacrifice for us, right? So how much more are we, you know, how much more can uh, we have, uh, you know, what, what is our inheritance? What else can we inherit um, when we truly tap in and believe, okay, you know, God, you paid it all. You, you know, Jonathan has nothing on Jesus. Right. Right. So when we think of, of it in that way, we can leave that load of our mindset behind. Um, so so now this week, I just want to get into how do we truly activate God's definition of us? Because clearly it's an amazing definition. It's the ultimate definition. Uh, and that's the one that we want to focus on, not what the people say, not even what our family members said. You know, I want to focus on God's definition of me. And that truly takes relationship. That's the first thing. Um, so there's this concept in my clinical practice of the inner child, how uh, when I'm, I'm meeting with a client and, you know, we're talking and, um, you know, in, in our sessions, we're looking at the past, not to fester in it, but to confront it. Um, and I would say like in spiritual terms or in, you know, in the Bible, you know, it's like the inner child, right? That's like, it's like the oldest part of us. The, the Bible refers to this as the old man, right? We don't want to operate uh, with that old man mentality or, you know, our former self, you know? Um, we, we want to put on the new man, right? Because we are new uh, in Christ, right? When we accept <clears throat> Christ into our lives, excuse me. So um, it takes relationship. It truly takes relationship with God uh, in order to activate, um, uh, our, you know, God's definition of us, right? So not, it's it's the that holy reverence and fear that can put us in, into alignment with, okay, who we're supposed to serve. But it, then we want to focus on um, the development of relationship. You know, what does your prayer life look like? You know, what does your prayer life look like um, in order to heal the, the inner child and to put off the, the old man? Um, we receive God as our, our, our Lord and Savior. Right. We receive his salvation. But it doesn't just stop there in order to activate new precedents. Um, I need relationship with God. I want to have increased discernment, you know, um, sometimes. And I'm preaching to myself. Right. Like we can have like this, you know, sort of five minute prayer before dinner or before breakfast, you know, and God's like, hold on. Like, I want more of you. I truly want to commune with you. You know, I, I don't want um, this, you know, microwave relationship, you know, or, you know, I don't want us, you know, he's like, I don't want you to be a part-time Christian. You know, sometimes we can 
we can be part time, you know, people expecting like this full time reward. And it doesn't work like that, you know. And I just love how there are so many verses that reflect like the scriptures um, uh, will emphasize all. You know, like the word all, you know, like when you seek me, you will find me uh, when you uh, seek me with all your heart, you know, lean not into your own understanding. Acknowledge um, a God in all in all your ways and he will direct your path. There's this emphasis. He's like, you know, like I, I know, you know, you know, it's like, OK, well, oh, my God, I did seek you. But hold on. Did you actually seek God with everything on the inside of you? You know, did you truly cleave to God? You know, because whatever we're consumed by or we're giving our time to, um, it's almost like, you know, a, a form of worship. You know, what are we worshiping? You know, but we want God to have our full worship um, and uh, and we want God to have full authority over us um, so that we're on the course that we're supposed to be on. So um, so relationship is important. Uh, but so, you know, and getting a little bit further and I just wrote down some notes because I did not want to skip over anything. Um, let's see. Here's the other thing about relationship that. A uh, relationship with God truly helps us identify um, with truth, right? Because we know that God is truth. He, you know, he is the spirit of truth, right? So uh, if we're not being led by his spirit, what other spirit are we being led by? Um, you know, and, and also the scripture talks about how the enemy or the devil is the author of lies. Uh, he, he, knows no truth, no good thing or no truth is inside of him. Right. So we have this, you know, we have God and then, you know, this antagonist, right? God has a plan for us. And it's like the enemy's plan to disrupt that plan. And he wants to disrupt that connection. Right. So there are things that are going to happen in childhood. There are things that happen in childhood and you know, our teenage years of young adult life and older uh, adult life. Right. Because the enemy doesn't stop. You know, he doesn't take any day off. So it, you know, why should we, you know, that's why we don't need to be a part-time Christian. It's, it's a full-time get, right? We, we have to give all of ourselves to it, right? We, so that, I mean, what, pray without ceasing is no joke. It, it really is no joke. We want to have that spirit of truth so that we're exposing every lie of the enemy. Um, and it's just amazing because uh, the story that I want to integrate into this message is um, the one of Jacob, um, Jacob and Esau. Uh, so we can see this very clear that, um, you know, so Jacob and Esau are born. Um, and my goodness, uh, Jacob and Esau are born. Um, and what this, oh yeah, Jacob learned, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I have so many thoughts going through my, my mind right now that I want to make sure I get out. So, um, so we know that Esau uh, is the firstborn, right? Even though they're twins, he comes out first, right? And it's amazing because, you know, even Rebecca knew that something was going on in her stomach, like they were fighting in her stomach. And, and God tells her that, um, you know, there are two nations on the inside of you. Um, and that, um, uh, you know, the youngest is, well, the oldest is going to end up serving the youngest, Right. So it's like even the way they came out of her womb, uh, Esau had his uh, hand. I'm sorry. Jacob had his hand on Esau's heel, which is like this crazy. It's this foreshadowing of what was to come. So anyway, so they're born. Uh, Rebecca has favor for uh, Jacob. Um, and then Isaac has this favor on Esau. And they describe Esau as like, you know, red and hairy and Jacob um, as this plain man, a plain sort of type of man. Uh, Esau is, you know, the type that uh, is he's a hunter. He's a man of the field. Right. So um, so later on, um, uh, it is Isaac that gets older and uh, he wants to um, bless, you know, his his firstborn son. So he, he tells Esau, um, you know, like, hey, I want you to go get some venison. You know, I'm, I want to have me a good supper. And then, you know. I want to bless you. You know, I want to feel good in my soul and I want to bless you. I want to give you this blessing um, that God has bestowed upon me, you know, 
Um, right. We, we constantly refer to the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I mean, he, you know, God said, hey, I'm going to I'm going to bless your seed. You know, I'm, I'm going to multiply you. The seed that you're going to have is going to be, you know, like even more than the stars Lord, in, in the sky. In Jesus name, it's going to be um, more than the dust um, that covers the ground. I'm going to multiply you and bless your seed. You're going to have met so much land and, and this and that. Right. So this is a big blessing. Um, and so as a matter of fact, let me step back even before that, um, even before that Esau came in from the field and he was so hungry. Um, and Jacob had just cooked something. Um, and Esau's like, you know what? I think I want, I, I want some of that. Like I, I need to eat. Um, and Jacob says, well, how about you trade your birthright um, to me and then I will give it to you. And Esau's like, ah, you know, well, what good is my birthright anyway when I'm about to die? Um, so he literally gives up his birthright to Jacob um, and, you know, over something that was fleeting, you know. Um, and so that, you know, when I'm talking to some of my clients about, you know, addressing the inner child or certain decisions, um, we use, we, we use this concept of objectivity, you know, being as objective as possible An objectivity requires truth, which is why I was talking about God who is the spirit of truth. All right. So that way we can look at a situation and its wholeness, uh, versus what this person did to me or, um, you know, so we're not in this victim sort of mindset. Like, what can I learn from a situation? What did I do um, in that situation? So that way I can change the trajectory in the future. But anyhow, um, in, in this particular situation, we have Esau who um, who just gives up his birthright um, over something like this fleeting thing. Like he's so guided by uh, the lust of his of his flesh. Right. They, it, it, he was so subjective in that moment. Um, it's like he didn't know what he had and how much that was truly worth. And and many times we, we can struggle with this because if we don't know our worth, um, we can trade it off for spiritual blessing, you know, or that that, you know, spiritual that that protection that God wants us to have or that peace of mind that God wants to ha wants us to have, you know, whether that is led by pride or we want to be satisfied right in that moment, you know, or, you know, sometimes we can do that. We're like, we're going on, we're wanting to um, find love and we're, but we're because of the framework that we have or not the, this lack of recognition of our value, uh, we then end up attracting the mindset that we actually have. And it's like, it can take us into a tailspin of giving things up that we're not supposed to on the first date because somebody gave us some food. Come on, somebody. So it's like, you know, that's what Esau did, you know, and it was completely foolish, right? So now Jacob has his birthright. You know, he lacked that objectivity. He was just focused on the moment and it became impulsive, right? So then later on, Esau, I mean, Isaac says, all right, go get me some venison. I'm going to bless you. Rebecca overhears it. And then she, um, you know, she deceives, like she teaches Jacob how to be deceptive. Um, and, you know, she said that, well, how about, you know, you, I'm, how about you go get two goats and I'm going to prepare the meal so that way you can give it to your father, right? So early on, again, we're learning about ourselves by the reactions of the people around us. Um, Rebecca wanted to do things her own way instead of God's way. We, she wasn't focused on the promises of God, um, but versus, instead of the, the impulsivity um, of her own nature or her being. Um, and, you know, Jacob, you know, he struggled with this because he said, well, I don't want to then be cursed instead of blessed. And she said, well, let the curse be on me. Um, and, you know, it's just interesting here, you know, it, it, it even again, it takes me back to the clinical setting of um, as a result of what happens to us, uh, whether in childhood or through, throughout our life. If that pain is not healed, uh, it can be transferred. 
pain that is not transformed can be transmitted, right? The, the way I see, the way I, however I learned about myself by what somebody did to me, whether that was sexual trauma, emotional trauma, or physical trauma, if I don't heal, um, unfortunately, sometimes I can end up transmitting that same thing, you know, or um, if I am, let's see, so, focused on, um, if I'm so focused on how somebody hurt me or the pain that they caused me, uh, I can even make that into an idol in my life and then try to like find these shorthanded ways of, of um, you know, dealing with people, you know, that just doesn't reflect a good character, right? So, um, so anyways, so this is what so this is what Jacob is kind of learning about himself. He's learning how to be a deceiver. You know, he's learning to be deceptive, essentially, like, it, you know, there's this character flaw um, or this, uh, you know, this this challenge early on with integrity. Um, so he ends up fooling his father. The other thing here is um, until we we sit back, you know, and, and truly are healed or get the help that we need, again, we're going to sort of repeat the same behaviors and attract the same things. Um, and this is where with my clients, I talk about having healthy boundaries. Healthy boundaries are important. Otherwise, we're going to continue um, do, attracting the same type of people, you know, whether it's you know, like, OK, well, someone keeps on exploiting me, you know, like I don't know how to use my no. So therefore, people are overusing my yes. Or maybe I've learned how to um, steal early on in life. So then I keep attracting people who steal or I learn how to deceive early on. So I keep attracting those those types of people. Um, and so like where there are healthy boundaries that are needed, I would say even on the spiritual side, it's almost like having this unhealthy soul tie, which is also possible. I mean, if you look back at uh, in, in first Samuel or second Samuel, um, Jonathan and David, the word says that they had a, a healthy soul tie. Um, I believe that was, let's see if somebody can help me with that scripture. It was in first Samuel. It was first Samuel chapter 18, verse three, uh, where it talks about how they loved each other. Like Jonathan or David loved the other one as much as um, like from, from a place from his soul. So there was this healthy soul tie, you know? So sometimes we think of soul ties in the form of, you know, like uh, romantic relationships or um, after, you know, some intercourse or some sexual relationship has taken place, but soul ties can also be created in other ways. Um, so, I mean, it could, you know, like, so we can have unhealthy soul ties. Uh, you can have an unhealthy soul tie with a, a parent where there's this unhealthy codependency, um, this, uh, this prompt towards, you know, I want you to have power, but then, you know, the deception is involved, you know, so like we're either doing things the wrong way or teaching the child the wrong way. Um, it could be, with a supervisor, it can be with an ex, you know, it can, you can have an unhealthy soul tie with, with a, a variety of different people. And I do believe that God wants to heal us of that today. God wants us to have healthy boundaries. Um, and I can see here when I'm reflecting on uh, that concept and looking at the relationship between Rebecca um, and Jacob, it, it does appear that they have this unhealthy soul tie. She's like, I'm going to do it my way. This is how I'm going to teach you. You know, um, you know, so it, it, it's amazing because still, you know, God, God already knew how things were going to be. And he used that um, and, and turned it around. But just want to paint a picture about um, just when God, when we don't allow God to restore us, which ultimately he did with Jacob, um, we can we can continue to attract those things or stay uh, in a painful place. Um if those soul ties are not broken or if we don't have healthy boundaries, you know, maybe you can be struggling with someone that abandoned you, whether that was a, a, a pastor or a leader, you know, sometimes we're struggling with uh, rejection, you know, or um, some sort of trauma in the past. And, you know, the more you fixate on that person or that thing, uh, it, it could be a soul tie. You know, maybe they became an idol in your life that when they abandoned you, um, it hurt you to the core that, you know, it's like, well, 
you forgot who you are in Christ. You know, your identity was so warped and tied up into into them. And now they're gone. You know, it's like, you know, there's so much pain or anger there. And God is like, no, I want I want you to know who you are through me, not through that person. You know, like, who are you giving your authority to? You know, um, it's, you know, so, so, you know, just to uh, move forward, um, we know that Jacob is deceptive. Esau blesses him. I'm sorry, Isaac blesses him. Uh, Esau comes back. He finds out about it. He's just like rot. You know, he's so upset by this, obviously. Like, I, you know, anybody would just imagine, like, you already gave up your birthright. Um, cause you're, you know, being led by the flesh is sort of impulsive. And now, you know, your blessing is gone. So, you know, hate kind of, you know, comes into his heart and he's like, look, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to kill you. Like he's, he wants to hurt his brother, you know? So the mother is like, hold on. I don't want to lose my sons. She sends Jacob on. She sends him, um, to, uh, Laban, um, who's her brother. Right. She's like, OK, well, you know, go there, go, you know, kind of forget what happened. Um, you know, everything will be OK. You know, like, I just want to make sure you're safe. So she sends she sends him there. Um, and Isaac actually gives him, you know, sort of sends him on. You know, he's like, OK, you know, bless you. Um, uh, Mary, one of the daughters of Laban or, you know, something like that. Uh, so anyways, he goes there and on his way there. Um, he has this dream in which uh, he's reminded that, you know, God is still with him, you know. So I just also want that to be a reminder to you that no matter um, how you were treated, you know, growing up or how somebody might have treated you recently, you know, be reminded that God's promises are still yes and amen. You know, we don't have to uh, become discouraged uh, due to the opinion or the, the, the reflection, um, the, the, the behavior that was reflected in somebody else towards us. You know, the more that we abide in God, we're abiding in love, you know, God, because God literally is the definition of love. And the word says that uh, God's love will cast out all fear. Right. So, um, you know, it's even in that dream when he woke up, he said, wow, God's presence was here. Presence was here and I knew it not, you know, um, you know, so I just want that to also encourage us that we don't have to um, get discouraged or think that God doesn't see our pain or he's not seeing us. No, God sees us. He's right there. We just have to seek him out. You know, we have to literally stand uh, on his word and in his word and activate it activated. Like the more we're abiding in God, the more we're seeking him with all of our heart, we're activating his definition of us. You know, we're seeing ourselves in a different light. So, um, so she sends him off, you know, almost like, you know, like he's running away from his problems. And sometimes we've also run away from problems because of pride, ego, or shame, or whatever the case is. Um, and, but this part, this next part, I think is just so amazing because he, he, you know, the deceptor um, is also deceived. You know, he goes and works for Laban, Laban for seven years. Uh, he thinks he thinks that he's going to get married to Rachel, but instead he gets married to what? To Leah. Um, and then, you know, he has to work for another seven years. Um, and then he is then given Rachel. And the issues don't even stop there. But when I look at that, um, it's just a, it's so amazing to me because I believe that God is almost it's like teaching him um, about having integrity, you know, and you have to work for um, your reward or what it is that you want. You can't just take somebody's um, birthright or you can't just take somebody's thing um, and uh, just get it the easy way. You know, so it, many times like some clients will ask me uh, or will be sort of distraught about where they are in life or, you know, they want to develop their skills. They don't know where to start. But there's this like, again, there's this impulsive mindset. Like I want to my you can't microwave mastery, you know, like the things that God wants to give us. You know, he wants to prepare. He wants to prepare us for it so that we can even handle um, what it is that he gives us. Because imagine if he, if we were this entitled people that he just gave things to, 
many times we squander those things. It's like we're not good stewards of of what God wants to give us. If I can't handle a hundred dollars, how am I going to handle a million dollars? You know, God wants us to really become masters. He wants to have He wants us to have integrity. He is the God of truth. You know, and he is a just God. He's a loving God, but he's also a just God. You know, so I believe that even in that situation, he's teaching Jacob integrity. You know, although Jacob is like a track, he was deceptive. He attracted a deceiver. Right. But he's like, now, no, I'm, I'm changing your character. That flaw that was introduced early on that, you know, that ungodly soul tie that came in. I want to restore you and I'm going to break every stronghold in your life. Right. So he does this. I mean, just amazing thing. Um, and, you know, Laban has given him a hard time. It's given him such a hard time. But finally, you know, God is like, OK, now it's, it's time to go. Um, and, you know, he leaves. Right. He leaves. And. Um, you know, he's hopeful. He's hoping that Esau has changed his mind. He's hoping that his heart has changed. Um, and he sends, I, I believe, some of his servants um, to greet Esau. And the servants come back and said, that, hold on, your brother is coming to meet you, too. But by the way, he has 400 other people um, with him. So instantly, you know, Jacob is like, oh, my goodness, he's going to kill me. Like, I don't want this to happen. Um, so he becomes so fearful. And it's like he again forgets that God is with me. He forgets that he forgets about the promise. He forgets about God's definition of him. You know, so oftentimes we have to be reminded, you know, um, you know, like we, we have to be reminded of, of God's definition or we have to remind ourselves of God's definition of us. He, he sends his family before him um, and he sends his cattle before him, maybe hoping that if Esau saw them, you know, he would, you know, change his heart, have some, you know, flutters or, you know, see things differently. Um, and then we also know that later on he, he, you know, and he struggles or he wrestles with God or he, you know, God sends this angel and he wrestles with this angel and he's wrestling. And, um, you know, finally, you know, he, you know, the angel says, I'm about to leave. And, and Jacob is like, I'm not going to leave until you bless me. You know, I need protection. You know, it's like that, that stubbornness sometimes that's within us. Um, it's, you know, we're like wrestling with God. We're wrestling uh, and God wants to take us to a place so that we can make peace with the past. Because until we make peace with the past, um, it can take up uh, our present or our future capacity. You know, God wants us to forgive those that hurt us. Um, and and also he wants us to be able to receive forgiveness. He doesn't want pride or ego um, to take up so much place in your capacity or take up any space in your capacity that is preventing you from moving forward. So whether it was, you know, you that might have hurt someone or me that might have hurt somebody or or maybe we were on the other side of it. You know, God wants us to experience forgiveness, forgive um, and be forgiven. Right. So forgiveness is also important in activating God's definition of us so that way we can we can also make peace with the past. So that's also uh, a concept or, um, uh, you know, an activity or approach that I take my clients through is, is what does forgiveness look like? You know, if we're harboring, harboring resentment because somebody left us or left the church or, you know, spoke to us this way at church or at our job or or, at, you know, in our house, our spouse said spouse said this thing to us or whatever the case is, um, you know, and we haven't forgiven. It's there's this one way that forgiveness is described. And it's like when you're harboring that resentment, it's almost like drinking poison and hoping that the other person dies. You know, it's it's poisonous to your soul It's poisonous to your mind, you know, that you can begin to have these rep, uh, repetitive thoughts about the person again to the point that it almost becomes an idol. It's like an ungodly soul tie that God is like, no, I want to break that. I want to break that. You know, sometimes we struggle with forgiveness because we think it's condoning the behavior, but it's not. It actually empowers you. It empowers your future. It allows you to have the, the peace of mind so that you can uh, experience the sound mind that God said he gave us in 
um, in Second uh, Timothy 1 and 7. Right. I've not given you a spirit of fear, but power, love and a sound mind. And, you know, if God wants to give us that peace that surpasses our understanding. But we we it's going to be hard for us to experience that peace when we're so focused on doing things our own way. It's like, no, I'm going to send them. You know, I don't know if I really want to come and, and confront the past, you know, or I don't know if I really want to go say sorry because my pride and ego is going to be, you know, like my pride is going to be hurt. No. You know, and I understand Jacob was actually fearful of his life, but sometimes we will even treat our ego or protect our ego just as much as we're protecting our life. You know, and when we're doing that, it's like we're trying to live in our own way versus the way that God says we need to live. You know, so it's going to be hard to then be um, our authentic selves or, you know, activate who God says we are if I'm focused on how I do things or how I want to do things, you know? So, so it's like God is taking him through this process so that way Jacob can activate God's definition of him. So even as he's wrestling with this angel, you know, it, he gets a blow to the hip, you know, and um, almost like, you know, like he, he, he got hit, you know, sometimes it takes a hit or what I call being in the ditch, like being in a hole, almost like um, Joseph was. So that way, like when you're when you're down, it's amazing how when we experience experience some sort of challenge or we're down in some sort of in the hole, it it has a way of bringing us closer to God because it's like, well, oh my goodness, like what else can I focus on? I can't really. I want to get out of this thing, you know. There's this tendency. For us to then like call on God, it brings it can bring us closer to God. And, you know, God will do something with you while you're in the ditch, you know, because he truly wants to be the director of your life. You know, like he when you're in the ditch, all you can do is look up to the hills from where your help comes from. And our help comes from God. So Jacob gets this blow to the hip. You know, he's asked about, well, you know, what is your name? And again, he's seeing himself in the way that he's seen himself all these years, even since he was a child, when his mother, you know, was um, teaching him how to be deceptive. And it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm just Jacob. I'm Jacob. And, and he was told what? No, I'm going to change your name. Actually, you know, you are what? Israel. Or I'm going to call you Israel. You're not what happened to you and you're not what you've done. So if you're ever wondering, can I be used by God? Can God use me uh, in a mighty way? The answer is yes. You know, when we focus on God's definition and activating God's definition, I'm not just going to be a hearer of the word, but I'm also going to be a doer of it as well. Like if God could um, change Saul, who was a murderer of, of Christians, Saul now turned into Paul. What more can he do for you? If he forgave him, he can forgive us, too. You know, um, so it, it's just amazing. It's, it's amazing um, what, the, you know, the process that got to Jacob through. Right. So now he has a new name. Right. Old things have passed away. But behold, new things have come on. Right. Come on, someone. We know that scripture. And in um, verse, let's see, verse 30, uh, Jacob says, I have I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved, you know, and I sort of equate that to I recognize, you know, what I've been through didn't kill me. If you are here, you are undefeated. It didn't kill you. You know, you are here, you know, and again, I, I encourage you. Um, to have a relationship with God, allow, you know, God's truth to set in. Right. Because in John, it says um, you will know the truth and it's the truth that's going to set you free. It's going to set you free from every soul tie, you know, every ungodly soul tie. It's going to allow you to have healthy boundaries. You know, abiding in God's love elevates the understanding that you have of yourself and people as well. We're not just battling against flesh and blood. Right. But I'm going to activate God's definition. I'm going to put on the full armor and I'm going to see myself the way God sees me. All right. All right. I hope this word is sticking and it's making sense. Um, so, 
his word also says to seek his face continually. You know, and I, and I, I like to remind myself of that verse even. Seeking God's face and his strength continually. God knows that we're not perfect, but he is mighty in our weaknesses. You know, we're meant to be dependent on God. If there's anybody that I want to be codependent on or have, you know, just a really healthy, like tie, soul tie to it is God. My soul belongs to God. I'm not my own anyway. You know, I was bought with the price. Right. I, that's I. That's who I want to be tied to in that way, because I know God is not going to ever leave me or abandon me or forsake me. You know, I'm not going to have, you know, a trauma of, you know, God, you know, of, of this rejection. Oh, my, you know, how I was rejected, may have been rejected by some man in the past or, you know, a friend in the past. No, God is not a man that he will lie. He's the same God yesterday, today and forevermore. You know, so again, it, go, it, it goes back to relationship once more. Right. So um, forgiveness. Right. Forgiveness is key. So uh, in making peace with the past in my closing, he gets the courage. All right. He's like, all right. Now, you know, I'm Israel. You know, I just got this blow to the hip because actually God wants me to walk differently and talk differently. I'm this new creature. You know, I'm seeing myself in the way that God sees me. And then he meets Esau. And it's just, it's almost like a fairy tale, you know, like it's you, when, when we, when our ways, what does the scripture say? When our ways please God, he will make your enemies to be at peace with you. We don't have to worry about the outcome. Even if someone doesn't want to have a, say we hurt somebody, you know, and it's like, okay, well now you're feeling a conviction to actually go and say, sorry. Uh, to this person and they don't want to have a relationship with you, it's okay. Be so full of God's love that you're not going to allow um, the res how somebody else responds to your kindness. You don't have to allow their response to dictate your emotions. Be so full of God's love and peace that pride doesn't have to operate or lead you or prevent you from you know, saying, you know, sister so-and-so, I'm sorry. For, for how I came across, you know, or I'm sorry for how I treated you because this person left me and I was so tied to them. I was so connected to them that, you know, when they left, I didn't really know who I was anymore. And I didn't see how I could then connect with you or be under your leadership, you know, and I, I'm actually sorry for doing that, you know, and, and I recognize that now, you know, let's, it's, it's just amazing how just forgiveness, releasing, allowing God's peace to come in will also empower you and empower your relationships. If we're stuck allowing that old man or that inner child to just kind of rule our lives, it, it creates at least a self-sabotage and self-destruction and it will ruin relationships. God wants to heal our hearts today. Yeah, I really believe he wants to do that. All right. So uh, Esau and now, you know, Israel, they make peace. They give each other hugs and high fives. And it's, you know, it's just amazing. You know, the last thing I'll say is and fully activating um, God's definition of you pray for a renewed mind. Lord God, renew my mind. You know, be a stranger to this world. Don't be carnally minded. You know, pray that, you know, you have the mind of Christ. Look at the fruits of the spirit, you know, God's nature, because you are made in his image anyway. So if you really want to get to know yourself, it's not going to be through the identity of somebody else, but through um, who God says you are. It's identifying in Christ so that you can understand who you are to begin with and activate it. You know, when you're under God's Lordship. And when you're under God, he's the one that's going to give you permission to step up and do different things that you wouldn't have ever thought of. I wouldn't have thought of being here. And y'all, I'm doing this imperfectly. I'm not a perfect um, speaker at all. You know, I speak in my in my Facebook group. That's, you know, where that's a ministry that God has given me. Um, but at the, the more I um, am obedient and I surrender you know, God is stretching me, you know, this, you know, God is still using me imperfectly, but God, God is perfect. His word speaks for itself. So I don't have to be perfect. All I need to do is depend on him. And he's the one that gives me strength. You know, so I just pray that that even encourages you, you know, focus on things that 
are noble or, uh, you know, are of good report. That's what it says in Philippians chapter four, you know, and then also the last thing I want to say is protect your ear and your eye gates. Be very mindful of what you're letting into um, your spirit. Right. Um, the word also says that, you know, what are you watching on television? You know, um, what are some of the toxic patterns that might have been there or the type of relationships that, you know, that um, you have typically had with people? You know, sometimes we you, some relationships can be built on gossiping like that's oh, well, that's just what I do uh, with brother so and so or sister so and so. Like that's the makeup of our relationship. God's like, no, nah, nah, I want, you know, let's have healthy boundaries. We want to break off any soul tie, any ungodly soul tie. We don't, we, you know, we want to have, you know, almost good relationships like Jonathan and David had where they looked out for each other. They were close, but it, it they empowered each other. They didn't enable a negative pattern or behavior, you know? So I pray that this is landing and that this, that this is making sense. Um, one thing I do want to uh, express is uh, if you want to give or sow a seed, I believe the moderators in the chat um, can show you how to do that or drop a link below. Um, and then also be sure to show up for service on Sunday at 10 a.m. at NTG. Um, and I am just going to end in prayer. I just I just pray that, you know, God truly, you know, blesses everyone or blessed everybody. And uh, you got some insight, some good just conviction, y'all. Like, I, I really do thank God for his conviction because it, it just really keeps me on, on that straight and narrow. I don't want to stray away. You know, it gets me back on course. But anyways, dear Lord, I just thank you so much for your word, Lord God. I thank you for this message, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, Jesus, that your word makes sense, Lord God, Jesus. I thank you, Lord God, that you actually use the most imperfect people, Lord God, Jesus, to, to get your word across, Lord God, Jesus. People who are who have made who have made mistakes before or who have been hurt before, traumatized before. But I just thank you that we don't have to stay in that trauma, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, Jesus, that when we allow your spirit to come in. It's the spirit of truth that actually guides us, Lord God, so that way we can have increased discernment, Lord God, about what we're doing, who we're around, Lord God, about how to interact, how to be. Um, our state of being, Lord God, can be completely different, Lord God. That I thank you that we uh, can look at the lessons from the past instead of the pain from it, Lord God. I thank you that you showed us even in this story that even Jacob learned how to have integrity. He learned, Lord God, Jesus, how he, he learned, Lord God, the, the lesson that you wanted him to learn. He learned how to see, Lord God, himself through your eyes, Lord God, and to activate that. So I just pray that we not only hear your word, but we activate it, Lord God, that we let go of some pain, Lord God, trauma, Lord God, Jesus, or all the pain, not some of it. You said to seek to seek you with all our hearts, Lord God. So I believe, Lord God, you want to heal all of our pain. You want us to have um, all peace, Lord God, Jesus. So I just thank you, Lord God, and I just praise your holy name. I give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.